For our next uh, session to begin, it's a panel session and we're going to be talking about transforming end of life care and why we can't afford not to. And when I was sent this brief, I just thought, wow, that, that's, that's a big question. First question was, what is a good death? Wow, that's, that's like, that's one of the biggest questions of life, isn't it? What is a good death? Well, surely we must all want a pain-free and dignified death for ourselves and for our loved ones. The irony is that whilst medicine and good health care can extend lives and often cure diseases, where are these advances to be found when someone desires to die without pain and suffering? So the next plenary is going to explore why it's so important to work with people in their last 12 months of life to ensure that they get the best health care and to get the death as much as they can that they want. Okay, that sounds like a strange introduction, but I'm sure it will make more sense when we get our panel up. Let's meet our panel if you'd like to come out now. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a round of applause, some encouragement. And I will introduce them so that you know who they are. We have Jane Collins on the end there, Chief Executive of Marie Curie, Simon Pierce, End of Life Care Lead for, the, for ADAS, and Biwi, National Clinical Director for End of Life Care and Consultant in Palliative Medicine. This panel will be led by, chaired by Catherine Sleeman uh, from the National Institute of Health Research. She's a clinician scientist and honorary consultant in palliative medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? So it is a huge pleasure to be here today to speak about end of life care. The way we're going to run this session is I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes and then we're going to open up into a panel um, discussion. I would like to kick off by telling you a very short story. In 1951, a young nurse working on a surgical ward at St. Thomas's Hospital made an observation that was simple and radical. The observation was that doctors desert the dying. The nurse was Cicely Saunders. Cicely went on to commit her life to transforming how we care for the dying through foundation of the modern hospice movement. 50 years later, today, I think we need a new transformation because how we die has changed. It's changing and we're facing a crisis. A crisis not for the hospice movement. This is a crisis for the NHS. It wasn't much before Cicely's observation that doctors had so little with which to do their doctoring that much of what we did was palliate, tend to the dying. But during the 20th century, that all changed as doctors very quickly became good at something we had never been good at before, saving lives. The average human lifespan increased during the 20th century by as much as it had during the preceding 30 millennia. And that changed not just when we die, it changed how we die. Because back when the average human lifespan was about 50, most people died suddenly from infectious diseases. Death was a discreet, relatively unpredictable event. But for us and for our patients, death will occur by stealth. We will live with chronic medical conditions, heart failure, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and our final weeks, months, probably years, will be characterized by slow, progressive deterioration. Living longer means dying slower. Slower and with ever greater complexity as we now have time to accumulate multiple medical conditions. And we're at a tipping point because those Fast increases in longevity have left a surprising legacy in terms of population projections. The number of deaths that occurs every year in this country is no longer going down as people manage to stay alive for a little bit longer. In fact, it's set to rise by about 20% over the next 20 years. 
That's an extra 100,000 people dying each year, slowly, and with complexity, who we will need to care for. Arguably, one of the greatest challenges our society, let alone our NHS faces, is how we care for these patients. And as you know, part of this challenge concerns money. It's estimated that between 15 and 20% of total healthcare expenditure is spent in the last one year of life. Well, of course, it makes sense that we would spend the most money on the people with the most complex needs. But the question is, are we spending this money on the right things? Are we providing value for our patients and for society? The value of any healthcare intervention can be measured using this very simple equation. Gains in quality offset by increases in cost. So a good example of a high value intervention would be something like vaccination. It saves millions of lives and costs very little. What we want to avoid are low value interventions, expensive interventions that don't improve quality. So if we want to measure value, then obviously first we're going to have to understand quality and this is where it starts to get a little bit tricky because you can appreciate that many of our usual outcome measures, improved survival, reduced morbidity, may not be very relevant when people are dying. Well, the best way to find out what quality means when someone's approaching the end of their, end of their life is to ask them and several studies have done just this. It turns out that most people faced with a terminal illness don't choose to prioritise their longevity over everything else. They want to be uh, comfortable, symptom free, surrounded by their carers and family, treated with dignity and respect, ideally in a place of their choosing which is usually their own home. But I don't have to tell you that all too often there is a gap between what people want and what people get. End of life care is a recurring and consistent theme in NHS complaints, said the Ombudsman's report, Dying Without Dignity. We need to close this gap between what people want and what people get. How? Well, one potential solution is through palliative care. We now have good evidence, randomised control trial evidence, that early palliative care significantly improves quality for people who are dying. So in these five randomised control trials, the patients who received palliative care, they had improved quality of life, improved physical symptoms, less depression and better satisfaction. One of these trials, the TEML trial, also showed that patients who receive palliative care have less aggressive care overall, so they were less likely to attend emergency departments, less likely to be hospitalised and more likely to die in their own homes. Now what is crucial to appreciate from these trials is that patients weren't randomised to receive standard care or palliative care. The intervention arm was standard care and palliative care as an extra layer of support. This isn't about forcing our patients to forego potentially life-sustaining treatments. It's about giving them choice. So palliative care improves quality, but value is also a function of cost. Is palliative care cost-effective? Well, we now have increasing evidence that yes, it is. In fact, a recent systematic review of evidence has shown that palliative care is frequently, paradoxically, cost-saving. So the extra expense incurred by the team itself is offset by the fact that patients are having fewer expensive interventions and trips into hospital. And what is more, timing. Getting this in early appears to be really crucial. A recent cohort study from the US showed that patients who had a palliative care consultation within two days of admission to hospital had overall hospital costs that were 24% lower. 
if that initial consultation was delayed for just a few days, the cost saving reduced to 14%. So taken together, what these studies tell us, I think very convincingly, is that our historical model, Sicily's model, of palliative care as the bit that happens after all the medicine has finished is wrong. This model is no longer appropriate. Palliative care works best when it's provided early and collaboratively as an extra layer of support. So with my academic hat on, I'm very encouraged by these studies. But with my clinical hat on, and certainly from the point of view of my patients, I start to see a bit of a problem because my patients understand that palliative care might help them feel a bit better, but they also worry that if they're having fewer of our fancy tests and treatments, if we're spending fewer of our healthcare resources on them, then they will also die a bit quicker. Well, this is the bit that has surprised everyone because three of these five studies showed that the patients who received the palliative care lived significantly longer than patients who received standard care alone. Is it because they were less depressed? Is it because they were less often in hospital picking up our nasty infections? Is it because many of our fancy tests and treatments actually do more harm than good when people are seriously ill? The truth is, we don't know. But what is clear is that high quality, person-centered care is a high value intervention. Palliative care works. But there is a problem, and it's of course one of provision. It's estimated that about, that at a minimum, three quarters of all deaths in this country could benefit from palliative care. That's 375,000 people every year and it's going up. We would need to vastly expand our specialist palliative care workforce in order to even begin to impact on the number of people who could benefit. Yes, a vast expansion of specialist palliative care is part of the solution. But there's another part and I think it starts with the people in this room because I I worry, I fear that the NHS is simply not taking end-of-life care seriously enough. Last year, the Royal College of Physicians published an audit of hospital deaths, which showed that just half of NHS trusts had included a lay member responsible for end-of-life care on their boards, even though that was an explicit recommendation of the 2013 Neuberger Review. The same audit showed that one in three trusts provide seven-day face-to-face palliative care services, even though that has been a nice recommendation for more than a decade. A 2014 Royal College of Nursing survey showed that just one in 10 nurses in community and hospital settings felt well-equipped to deliver good end-of-life care. Access to social care, as we all know, can be a lengthy, complicated process and may result in potentially avoidable hospital admissions. And yet, over half of health and well-being boards don't include the needs of the dying in their strategies. A third of CCGs surveyed by the CQC hadn't undertaken any assessment of local end-of-life care needs. All of us, I will bet, work in organizations that mandate training in how to resuscitate someone whose heart has stopped. But how many of us work in organizations that mandate training in how to approach a conversation with someone whose heart is about to stop? We know that if we have these conversations, if we offer our patients choice, many will choose the less invasive option by not offering our patients this opportunity, we cause harm. The current situation where some people see a specialist palliative care team and the rest take their chances on a bad death is not only unfair, unethical, it's also uneconomic. We all need to become palliators 
competent in symptom control, competent in conversations, confident to approach those conversations before a crisis. The Neuberger Review showed us what can happen, I think, if we make the mistake of assuming that just because something isn't high tech, that it is low priority. There is no shortcut to good end of life care. We need to embed it in our clinical cultures. So I would like to ask you, what structures exist in your organizations to systematically improve care of the dying? How many of the organizations in this room have a, an annual report on progress in end of life care? What progress has been made? How is that progress measured? Does your trust board include a lay member responsible for end of life care as recommended by Julia Neuberger? If not, why not? How many of your nursing staff, whether in community or hospital settings, feel equipped to deliver appropriate end of life care? How many have access to training? How many have received it? I know that there are many areas where these things are being done brilliantly and we can learn from them. But I worry that even in these areas, the pace of progress is simply not enough to keep up with our changing demographic. 94% of all deaths occur outside of hospices. This is NHS core business. 40% of medical inpatients have dementia. 30% of hospital inpatients are in their last year of life. These people don't self-identify as having palliative care needs. They're on cardiology wards, surgical wards, AMU. Are we asking them what matters to them, what their priorities are? They might surprise us. There's been so much focus over the past decade on dying at home that sometimes I wonder whether we've forgotten that half of all deaths occur in hospitals, whether quality of care is rated as fair or poor by one in three. That's potentially 80,000 people each year who our hospitals are failing. What would our NHS look like? How much more efficiently would our NHS run if we transformed this care? This isn't about adding cost burden or complexity. It's about improving quality and efficiency. Earlier this year, the government published a national commitment to improve end-of-life care. What was not committed was any new funding with which to do that. So we are going to have to work with our existing structures. The Ambitions Framework published last year sets out what good end-of-life care looks like and the steps that need to be taken in order to achieve it. Yes, we need to embed end-of-life care in our sustainability and transformation plans. And we need to include not only evidence of need, but evidence of effective interventions and plans for monitoring progress. Care of the dying isn't a niche issue. It's a litmus test for quality and compassion. If we can't get this right, I don't think we're going to get the rest right. All of us in this room believe that people approaching the ends of their lives have a right to good care. The trouble is, at the very time when they most need our help, they are unable to ask for it. It's our duty as leaders in the NHS to anticipate these needs and ensure that that extra layer of support is available whenever and wherever it's needed. This is not about the last days of life. This is about the last months and sometimes years. 50 years ago, Cicely Saunders took death out of the NHS to show us what good care could look like. She did not expect us to leave it there. We now need to bring death back in. It's time for a new transformation in how we provide end-of-life care. And I think we now have the knowledge and hopefully the power
to achieve it. Thank you. Catherine, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic to listen to. Uh, so we're now going to head over to a question and answer session with the panel. And of course, questions from our audience. So if you've got questions, do let our ladies with the roving mics, Caroline and Tracy are out there somewhere, uh, let them know that you've got a question and we'll get it to the panel. Thank you. Uh, just to remind you who we all are, I'm Jane Collins. I'm Chief Executive of Marie Curie. Hello, I'm Simon Pearce. Uh, I'm the End of Life Care for ADAS, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Care. I'm Biwi. I'm a practicing consultant in palliative medicine in Oxford and also the National Clinical Director for End of Life Care in NHS England. Shall I say that? And um, we would have had on our panel with us Roberta Lovick, who is a person with personal experience of end-of-life care in that she looked after her daughter who died a few years ago. Unfortunately, she is unwell herself today and has had to pull out, but she has asked me to read a message out to you from her. And what she has said is that everywhere I go, I see a lot of good work happening. Of course, there's much more to be done, but there are lots of people doing their best and working really hard. I want to thank everybody for what they're doing. Thank you. And you know me, Catherine Sleeman from the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's College London. So have we got any questions from the audience? Just got one down the front here, please. Thanks, Tracy. Or oh, Caroline. Who's going to get there first? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jules, end of life care facilitator at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital. And I'm very busy um, trying to improve end of life care in the organisation I work. But I just wondered if you had some tips, really. We're, we've introduced an end of life plan um, in October 2014 and I've trained over 1,600 staff, but I still don't see as much use of it as I feel there needs to be. I think there's quite a lot of resistance since we lost the Liverpool Care Pathway, and using new tools um, can make some staff quite nervous. And um, I'm, I'm doing my best to try and Im improve and get people to use it and support them, but um, what are your views, really? Okay, shall I start us off then? I think the first, <clears throat> the first thing is to remember that tools are just that. They're simply tools. And actually, this is a great opportunity to change the way in which people think about caring, not only for dying people, but also for people earlier in that stage in the journey. Because if you can intervene earlier, then you will build those relationships. I think reminding staff that actually it's that relationship, it's that encounter, it's that moment that they touch with a person who's, who's, who's in hospital or who's, who's an outpatient, or the moment they touch with that person's family or those who are close to them, that every single one of those encounters really matters. And I think if you can get them to stand back a little bit and just get, it, get back in connection with why they're doing what they're doing, then actually the tools are simply there as an extra layer. So I would encourage that message. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm from a social care background. You'd expect me to say that uh, I think the, the conversations are really important. And the, the, the challenge I think everybody faces, is there's a culture change where I think it's quite difficult to have those conversations for staff in hospitals or outside. And I think part of uh, the task of, of leaders in the NHS in social, and in social yeah. care is to help people, and I absolutely accept the point about the livable care pathway, but to help people to have those conversations because it is the one opportunity and actually if you don't have them, you've really missed an opportunity and actually if you really want to make uh, a good job of caring and a good job of caring someone at the end of life, if you miss that question, Catherine's very clearly set out what happens. So it's an opportunity. I think it's critical to support staff. It's not comfortable territory, but I think if the... I think it's really important to try to get across to people the importance of taking the opportunity. Because if you forsake it, we can all give examples of what happens. 
I'd like to add a bit to that. I mean, again, from what you've heard from Catherine, the, the, the issue that I think a lot of staff feel is, will this look as if I'm giving up on them having this conversation? But as we know, and we have really good evidence now, that actually managing the symptoms alongside what might be active treatment in all its forms is very effective. And it means that the person has a much better quality of life. So I think those sorts of messages need to get out much more because I meet lots of doctors in particular who feel if they talk about death, the patient will feel I've given up on them. And that really is not the case. Well, I would also just add quickly, congratulations, well done. It sounds as though you're doing um, great, a great job. I think the LCP thing has, has been really difficult um, for healthcare providers. One thing I've uh, observed in the sort of immediate aftermath was a lot of people saying that their staff, nursing staff in particular, were lost without it. It had gone and they felt completely rudderless. Well, in my mind, that says that actually we never had those fundamentals of good care right. And that's what we need to start with. The, the fundamentals of symptom control, the fundamentals of communication and actually build up from that layer rather than perhaps swoop in with a, a piece of paper that could never make up for that. I think in the last few, few 20 minutes, we've heard a lot about how difficult it is to have those conversations. I'd be very interested to hear from the panel how do we make it less difficult to have those conversations? We are admitting that they're difficult. I know when my mum died, everyone was saying, so your mum's, um, she's, she's, and for you, and you're going through it, it's like, yeah, she died. It's in my reality. So how do we make those conversations before death more comfortable? I'd love to know your ideas, because you're the experts. I, w I would, I'll suggest one thing to start us off, and it's time. It's probably the most difficult thing of all to provide. But actually, these conversations do take time. End of life communication isn't a single event, it's a process. It happens once and then again and again, you build up a relationship. And actually, in the current healthcare system, doctors and nurses are so pressured in terms of time that actually, I think that is one of the, the most difficult things. Thank you. I think if you look across the system, I think there are two, two areas we've got to look at. One is actually normalizing those conversations within society and making that more, more conversations that we have with other people with, as part of sort of society. And there is quite a bit of movement on that front. But the other is, is actually making it okay for staff to be able to open up those conversations and to have the courage to have those conversations. And that's not going to come out of nowhere. That does come out of training, but more importantly, it comes out of role modeling. So they need to be able to see examples of good communication between senior colleagues with patients, with their families and so on. That's how people will learn. And that's really important that we all take that responsibility and recognize that the way we speak to each other, as well as the way we speak to, to our patients and families, is going to be mirrored right across the organization, from board level right down to, to, every, to everywhere, really. Lee, thank you. I, I think uh, I absolutely echo the last point. I think it needs to be an important thing in organizations, in NHS trust, in social care, in care homes, that these, th these things are important and management need to prioritise them and make sure staff are encouraged and supported to do it and to support them through that discomfort. I absolutely totally agree with the point about time. I think there's also uh, people, many of us have seen people who are good at this. Uh, there's, a, there's some skills that people can acquire. It's also a conversation, we have to think about what we would want ourselves. And what we'd want ourselves is not a com only a conversation is about how we want our symptoms managed and about bluntly how we die. We also want a conversation about how we're going to live before that. Because actually that's what people value, the opportunity to do things, to use that time and to understand it. Now that's not an easy conversation, but it's not an entirely negative conversation. So I think people can get an enormous benefit from that, from both sides of that dialogue. And just building on what you were saying, Simon, I think we have a responsibility, and I was a clinician in the past, 
to have those conversations because otherwise those people will miss that opportunity to plan with their family and friends in the way that we would probably all want to do. It's not just about writing a will, it's about saying things that perhaps you may have, should have said perhaps 20 years ago. In the past, there was advanced communication training, particularly for oncology teams, and that evaluated really well. There is good evidence that it helped people have those conversations. The problem is, how long does that training last for? So I think a more grassroots approach, which is sort of about setting how you should do it from throughout the organization and supporting junior staff, be they nurses or doctors or any other uh, clinical staff, let them see how you do it is probably a, a more, uh, a better way to actually really embed that within the NHS. So I'd like to share just one more reflection on that because it's just occurred to me that we've been talking about them as difficult conversations and maybe that is part of the problem that somehow we need to demystify those conversations and if a member of staff goes in feeling I've got to ask this person where they want to die well that's a pretty difficult conversation to have on the other hand if you're going in asking what matters to people what's your priority what's what's important to you right now that's a much easier human conversation to have, and I think we've got to try and demystify it as well. I am Mashud Haq. In my other hat, I am an ELC, end-of-life companion in my local hospital, which I enjoy thoroughly. Your keynote speech was excellent. What's startling is that death rate is going to rise. Now, can we have copies of your research on that? Have you taken into equations legalizing euthanasia in that? Or do you think there is a case for making euthanasia a legal choice for people at the tethers of their life? Um, so thanks for your nice comments about the presentation. All of the references are um, available on, I've got a blog site, and um, we can signpost that again maybe at the end. It was on my last slide. Uh, that was Office for National Statistics information about the, death, uh, the number of deaths each year going up. Um, I think in terms of legalising assisted dying, that is a whole other conversation to be had. My personal viewpoint is I think that where the law is at the moment is the right place to keep it. And I would rather focus my attention on the 500,000 people dying, the ordinary dying, rather than the much, much tinier number of people requesting assisted dying. I do think that is an important conversation to have, but I, I guess my personal feeling is that we, the first priority is to try and get end-of-life care for the ordinary dying as good as we can get it. Hi, I'm Robin Ghost, GP from York. Um, the key person in our team is the community Macmillan nurse that really uh, I've got on speed dial on my phone and regularly contact. Um, one of the biggest things is communication and is there a push nationally for our community Macmillan teams to be on a similar IT system to primary care GPs? Our specialist heart failure nurses are, we, you know, we, they send us messages immediately and they see our records, we see theirs. Is there that push nationally? Because oh, currently it it's, doesn't seem to be there locally. Okay, I'll, I'll pick up on that one then. So there is, um, in that there is something called, uh, uh, the acronym is EPAX, Electronic Palliative Care Coordinating Systems. It's a, a system rather than being any single one product, as it were. And the idea is that what, the, and that's already happening in parts of the country where actually the whole system is able to share the records with the patient's consent um, so that they can do exactly what you're saying there. Unfortunately, it's not everywhere yet, um, but there is, it is part of the strategy in order to push that out across the place. I don't know if you were here for this session by Professor Walker earlier on talking about digitizing the NHS, and that's exactly the, what the sort of thing that we're trying to do. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you. William Van Toff from the National Institute for Health Research. My question isn't about research. It's really a comment that so many of the burdens uh, in our society are being addressed by partnerships between health, social care, voluntary sector, and indeed um, commercial private sector. Could you give some examples of 
uh, really good partnerships that are addressing end of life issues or um, perhaps alternatively uh, think about opportunities that could address the issues that Cathy raised uh, through such partnerships. I'll have a go, William. Uh, yes, partnerships are crucial in uh, palliative care. And actually, there is a long um, history of working in partnership across all those different organizations that you described. I think one of the problems which we've still not got right, even though there are good relationships between the NHS, independent hospices, places like Marie Curie, the directors of adult social services, etc., is that we still find it very difficult from the person's point of view to join up the whole story about that person and their family. And so certainly we at Marie Curie hear stories of people feeling that there is a almost a rotating front door they've got because so many different people are coming in to provide care. And that actually was one of the triggers for looking again at what could be improved and, and the creation of the ambitions work. So Because so many people were saying that to us, uh, that it needs to be better coordinated. Clearly, technology should be able to help us. But we all know, those of us who've been in the NHS, that actually a technological solution can be very difficult to deliver. Uh, but we are still on that journey, I think would be fair to say, B. And um, we're, in some places, we are getting it right. So if we think about round Worthing, for example, that CCG have got a particularly good plan bringing all the parties together to enable uh, care to be delivered in a seamless way for the individual. Because they don't really care which organization is delivering it as long as they get it. And actually in Greenwich, we with the, uh, the Greenwich Hospice uh, and Marie Curie again are providing seamless care, uh, which is very much valued. Um, so we we can get it right in pockets, but again, very typical of the NHS, it's very difficult to do it across the whole of England yet. Just the, uh, the comment I'd make on that, I think, is only that, that I think it's absolutely true those partnerships can work really well, um, but they don't just kind of grow from nothing. Uh, they do need some leadership, some drive to get them off the ground, and I think they can be extraordinarily successful. Uh, and there are people who wouldn't normally be in the conversation who can bring a lot to the table. Um, obviously, lots of people die in care homes. And actually, care homes quite often are quite good at managing end of life because they do quite a lot of it. So there's a lot of experience out there. And in my experience, uh, a lot of willingness to get engaged. But it does take a bit of leadership, whether it be a health and well-being board or particular professionals, to, to push that partnership because it won't just grow because there are so many other things we all need to do. It will need a bit of prioritisation. I think the reason we were all waving madly this ambitions, of course, is that it is a prime example of partnership working, where for, uh, some of you were at the session this morning, so apologies for this, but 27 national organisations across health, social care, statutory sector, voluntary sector, royal colleges, specialist societies, CQC, GMC, all of that came together in order to develop it. What was actually very powerful was that process of building that relationship through this piece of work is probably a lot more substantial and long-lasting than we can quite describe here. And what's happened is that certain localities around the country have started doing that. So Cheshire, for example, has already got a very good system-wide partnership for palliative and end-of-life care. And then they've used this to kind of look together to see what are they doing and what is the shortfall locally together. So I think it's about, it's a, it's a ripple effect that, that needs to happen, really. Oh, hi, I'm Alison Massey. I'm one of the um, senior programme managers for the Modality Vanguard and End of Life Care is part of our programme. Um, I'm interested to go back to the conversation Bit, because I absolutely agree with you that we need to have the right conversations at the right time that are compassionate but I've just wondered what conversations we're having with communities and society at large because these conversations should start way before we get we medicalise death um, so how are we supporting carers and um, family with people that have been diagnosed with dementia uh, and understanding what their care needs are going to be at a time when they have capacity to be able to make those decisions and supporting people to be able to do that um, I just think we need to take this conversation a little bit wider and I'd also like to reflect that I'm, I've done 
um, cared for a lot of people at the end of their life. And 10 years ago, this um, audience, these seats would have been filled. And today, um, it, I, I was really shocked when I walked in that it wasn't, that the, because we had great conversations about end of life and dying 10, 15 years ago. And we had pathways that worked and we were having the right conversations. Um, and now we talk about tools and DNA CPR and they get in the way. So um, I don't expect you to have the answers. I just um, would say to everybody here that actually this is a bigger conversation than the ones we're having in hospice, hospices um, within community services. Um, thank you for that. I'm really interested by your observation that we have, we, the conversation has become, perhaps become narrower over the past decade. I don't think, well, I've not actually been in palliative care for a decade. Um, and I guess my impression was that we were starting to have more of these conversations through the work of things like Dying Matters. And every now and again, there's something in the sort of mainstream media or on the BBC about end of life care. And every time that happens, it's a little glimmer of hope because it is just pushing that door open for society to have conversations. I agree that I think that that is an enormous part of the step. There is no point in us healthcare professionals going round and round and round without managing to get outside the, the doors of these institutions. I think it's important to note that the, the number six ambition in the ambitions framework is about each community is prepared to help, and that's exactly what is aimed at. It's interesting what you say about this would have been filled 10 years ago. I actually think right now people are working their socks off, and that's probably a very good reason why we may not be seeing as many people here who are actually, they're out there delivering the care. They're, they're my colleagues who are back home while I'm here. So that's, I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of this does take place outside of forums like this. But thank you. I think the point about uh, system leadership is well made. I think, uh, um, obviously, there's a national cultural message, great when it's on TV, uh, but we all work in systems. And I think those systems need uh, to take some leadership about the end of life issue and about how people are cared for and the quality things that Catherine talked about. So I think there's something about health and wellbeing boards, uh, partnership groups, beginning to have, give this great priority and talk about it, not in as much about the minutiae of um, advanced directives, but actually how we see care being delivered across an area, across a range of organisations. I think that will help a bit. I don't think I've got anything to add to what they've said. I agree with all those points. And I know there's a lady with a microphone over there who wants to ask a question. <laughs> Hello. Can, can you hear me OK? I just, I just wanted to add on to what that lady was saying. Um, I just want yeah, to give a personal story, really, about a um, very poor end-of-life experience. Um, my father, five years ago, he had um, primary progressive aphasia, frontal temporal dementia. Very quickly after diagnosis, he lost the ability to speak and to communicate. So end of life discussions or any discussions about his wishes, we, we couldn't have those discussions with him. It deteriorated very, very rapidly. And despite, as a daughter, um, identifying that, that my dad was rapidly deteriorating and that, in my opinion, that he was approaching end of life. Um, I had to Google to look to see if there was actually a framework for or a framework for end of life planning, because obviously, as a, as a mother and as a wife, you know, as a wife, my mum was unable to accept the fact that my dad was um, vastly deteriorating. So, as a daughter, not only caring for a father and having to fight lots of systems, not only did I have to try and get a GP to acknowledge and have discussions with the family that, that my dad was approaching end of life, we also um, went for continuing healthcare funding, which was turned down because it was deemed that his illness was a social care illness, whereas, in effect, he was slowly starving to death because of the dysphasia and aphasia. My dad never hit hospital systems because as a family, we believed in caring for dad at home, but we wanted that support to do that and that support was sadly lacking because of 
all the applications that we went through, everything was turned down. Within two months of um, the application for continuing healthcare, my dad died. And he died at home in our arms. And it was a good death. But it was a good death that basically, um, the final days, um, basically it was a mad rush to get syringe drivers up to the house because a nurse came out and actually said, this man is dying. Now, this, you know, it, this isn't, mine isn't the only story. Um, I've since, obviously, I work for Age UK, but that isn't the, the, the guys that I'm giving this story under. This is as a daughter. But in the line of work, working across hospital, um, discharge, aftercare, and working with people at end of life, sadly, dementia is one of those areas where nobody is having those discussions and nobody is giving that support to families and providing that input. Um, you know, is there something that's in place? I know dementia is sort of one of the key areas, um, but in getting that support out there, that's one thing that, that I've not noticed a massive improvement in. So hopefully that's something that can sort of come forward in the future. Well, firstly, I think we'd all say we're very sorry about your experience, but it's good that he had a good death with his family. But I suspect you were all absolutely exhausted from what you were trying to do. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, there, there, there is and has been a tradition to associate palliative care with cancer treatment. And obviously people with cancer do have palliative care needs, and palliative care grew out of cancer, so to speak. There's been a greater recognition over the last few years, and that's one of the reasons why we at Marie Curie dropped the cancer care from our name, actually, is that many other conditions have palliative care needs. And uh, some work we've done recently demonstrated that people with dementia often have quite a lot of pain, which can be managed relatively easily, provided that's recognized. So I would have to say there is still a long way to go. Um, and particularly for an older person, it can be more difficult to access care as well. Uh, but there is more recognition, and we have a responsibility to make sure that, uh, as Catherine said, the, the 375,000 people who would benefit from palliative care, they will have all sorts of different diagnoses. Hello, um, I just wanted to say I'm here representing um, the Greater Manchester uh, and Eastern Cheshire Strategic Clinical Networks and we're in the really fortunate position of having funding for palliative and end-of-life care. Um, I'm on stand 82, I've got a number of resources there. Um, I'm here for another half an hour and then I have to go off to another meeting but if anybody here wanted to come and have a chat, have a look at the work that we are doing, pick up any of the resources, some of which do respond to some of the issues raised today, I'd be more than happy to help. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That seems a great note to end on. Make your way over to that stand. I'm guessing that you are now here waiting for the next session. That was great. I'm so glad you got the last 10 minutes of this one because this was a really important one. Please let's give a big round of applause to our panel. Fantastic session there. You don't want to be in the busy rush of the future stage. Do you? you want to come to the innovate stage and sit here and watch it all on the screen. Okay, we'll enjoy the next 10 minutes and then it all kicks off again. Thank you.